If you're a fan of Medieval 2 Total War or Crusader Kings, you're gonna wanna see this. Dreaming of conquest in historical settings is a mainstay on this channel, and it's not every day I get to check out an entirely new type of strategy game, but that's exactly what we're doing today, as I'm collaborating with Slytherin to finally show off Field of Glory Kingdoms in all its glory. But what is Field of Glory Kingdoms, and how does it play? Well, Kingdoms is the second game in the Field of Glory series to feature an actual campaign and the map, one that I've come to love as it really gives meaning to the battles on the ground. Here, you get to dive into the High Middle Ages and begin your grand campaign in 1054 AD, just before William the Bastard becomes the Conqueror, and just half a century before the Crusades sends score of Catholic armies to the Holy Land. Alternatively, there are tighter campaigns here, either in Iberia, the one between England and France, or even a localized one in the Near East. In this era, the war in Iberia rages on between the Spanish Christian kings and the Muslim taifas, while in Central Europe, the Holy Roman Empire dominates the political landscape. The Byzantine Empire remains a massive power on the crossroads between East and West, but powerful Muslim empires in the Near East threaten to upset the balance of power. In other words, it's the perfect time to dive into a turbulent period that's about to turn even more chaotic. But the fun part is that even though we can choose between major factions that were important to the larger events of this era, Kingdoms allows us to play basically any faction in the game. And notice the dedication to faction diversity and uniqueness here. No matter who you play, your duchy, kingdom or empire will feel different not just based on their locations, cultures and religions, but also because of their unique faction traits and situations. Indeed, the vast majority of factions are playable here, and all of them have their own special backgrounds. France, for example, is a petty kingdom, meaning it's rather small and weak compared to the more powerful realms out there. But on the other hand, you'll notice that France is also the overlord of three vassals. You'll get the context for the kingdom, telling you the history of the state and the situation it finds itself in, but when we go to gameplay, you'll get some really good tips about what to look out for. In a game that's deep and complex as this, it's useful to have some pointers on what to get to work on first. It is, however, in the last panel concerning modifiers that the most juicy stuff shows up, the unique faction features. For France, strong-willed vassals ensures more powerful subjects, but a more military-minded king for France itself. Late French culture gives, among other things, better chances of good relations with other factions and a much-increased crusade duration, and knightly cavalry which reduces upkeep of knights. The Holy Roman Empire, however, has a ton more vassals, and even more modifiers, with most of them related to actually being an imperial member state. Of course, the king of modifiers might just be Byzantium with about a dozen unique attributes. Remember though that modifiers aren't just positive, but often pose negative or risky sides as well, as evident with the Byzantine Empire, due to the likes of Imperial Restoration, which currently sits at the Crepit and gives penalties to several gameplay mechanics. Mechanics like these, which feature in smaller or greater numbers for every playable nation, makes Field of Glory's burgeoning kingdoms unique no matter where you play, whether it be as an Iberian Reino, gaining authority as you conquer Muslim provinces, or as Anglo-Saxon England, where civil war lurks behind the death of a ruler due to inherent internal turmoil. Of course, modifiers only constitute the basics of Field of Glory Kingdoms, so let's dive a bit deeper, because if you like, oh, let's say, favorites like Medieval 2 and Crusader Kings, you're gonna love this next bit. Because when we open the beautiful nation panel, your eye might just wander to this lovely noggin, the one belonging to King Henry Capet. Not only can we discern from this very panel that Henry is a benevolent ruler who commands more loyalty from his regions, but he is in fact also literate, can you believe it, providing some excellent bonuses. But click on his portrait and we open the entire dynasty panel, detailing who our wife is, our children, potential courtesans or concubines, our other relatives and other nobles, meaning we are looking at the royal court of the Kingdom of France here. Now obviously the king, which happens to be yourself, is the most important person here, but one look at the icons below the character images and we quickly find out what type of character they are. If they wear a golden circlet and green robe, that means they're a noble at court. If they wear a blue robe, that means they're holding office, a so-called peer of the realm. If they look like a bishop, that indicates they are a member of the clergy, and if any of your characters are dressed like soldiers, well, that means they're leading armies. Pretty intuitive all around. There is more to people than their station, however. Each male character had their own stat composition, ranging from administrative to military and pious affairs, even featuring their own offensive and defensive military skills, including one unique attribute per character. Combined, these will tell you which post they might be worth occupying, whether that be as governors of cities or as generals of armies. 
to spice things up, each character also comes with their own levels of health, meaning they might die or be killed, and importantly, their own loyalty status. This means that if you're not careful, characters may just end up acting against you and try to topple you. This comes alongside Field of Glory Kingdom's province system, where every region in the province has its own loyalty rating, alongside a slew of other factors. While loyalty on the character side is affected by things like your authority, which progresses over time if you're doing well, loyalty on the region side is affected by things like buildings, your region piety from churches and clergy, and importantly the various people in the region. You see, Field of Glory Kingdoms has a pop system that grows over time depending on your income of food. But what's awesome is that each pop come with their own job in life, such as peasants, clergy or noble, but that they also have their own cultural and religious backgrounds. For example, in Paris, most of our population is made up of French Christian Catholics. But notice how we also have one pop of French Jewish freemen. In newly conquered Normandy, which yes, means that Duke William never got the chance to travel to England at all, Franco-Norman pops are in the majority, but at least share our same religion, which mitigates part of their unrest. Now while these can be just as, if not more productive, than the base culture pops, pops of different cultural or religious groups will bring more tension to the region in the form of higher revolt risks, but can in fact be converted over time. And the same goes for heretics, by the way. But no matter their background, your population is vital to keeping your kingdom functioning. Pops are assigned to one of the six different industries, whether this be agricultural, infrastructure, commerce, military, piety, or stewardship. You can see that every resource produced or lost by a region is ultimately reflected in the total accumulated value on the kingdom level. But everything happens down here. So whether you manage your citizens by moving them around depending on need, or raise buildings at the right time to gain more money or produce more equipment, everything depends on how you manage your realm. And depending on your realm size, that can be a tough task. Realms in Field of Glory Kingdoms are distinguished by three aspects. These be their color, which is distinct, their coat of arms, displayed over each region, and their realm name, written atop the map. Sometimes these deviate slightly depending on your settings when it comes to vassals, so in my example here, my three French vassals also keep my color. You can see the leash vassal relationship by the dual coat of arms. I like this system a lot, and if there's something I'll always love no matter what, it's a map painter. And since my favorite colors to paint with tend to be blue and red, you know I'm playing France and England first. But just like in a certain other series, Kingdoms also offers map modes for a better overview of the game's various mechanics. We have the ownership overlay, culture and population maps, supply, political relations, religious map, a weather map, a terrain overlay, and more, all useful and important in their own way. Of course, it wouldn't be the Middle Ages without diplomacy either, which you can conduct with any faction, but the outcome of which will vary depending on your relations. I love how active the AI becomes at involving itself with you, even though it might take some time before it takes you seriously. Once I became a true regional player as France, for example, both the Holy Roman Empire, which by the way is very fragmented, and other minor factions reached out for alliances and cooperation treaties, while others still suddenly began laying claims to my regions, which undermined my national authority. Improving relations with royal marriages and gifts is vital to create lasting alliances. And through the Regional Decisions panel, you may even perform certain intriguing actions, like absorbing vassals when conditions are met, assassinate foreign or your own ruler, create new noble pops from newly conquered freemen, form vassals from your current territory, quickly raise new units, and so on and so forth, and more become available over time. Indeed, alongside regular diplomacy, which is quite deep, these regional decisions can even jumpstart certain powerful actions, like laying claim to a foreign region, which you need to start wars without incurring heavy the authority losses. This system is awesome, and because you gain these perks at a relatively unknown rate, with partial RNG involved, it doesn't feel like cheesing the system, because it feels like everything works as intended. And if you only have one claim perk to spend, for example, that's it, and you'll have to make use of regular actions or wait for another one, which might be a while. However, time is important in kingdoms, because it's over time that you see how well your kingdom is doing holistically, as indicated and systemized by your current government here, and whether you are accumulating progress or aging tokens. You see, fulfilling goals and generally running a well-functioning and expanding realm will allow you to improve your government rank, of which there are many. France, for example, begins the game as a young petty kingdom. But over time and with enough national authority, which is related to progress tokens, you can naturally upgrade your government here, to one day becoming various types of ascending kingdoms, monarchies or even empires. 
but the higher you upgrade, the easier it is to fall back down, meaning Field of Glory Kingdoms offers a system that makes it inherently challenging to run larger empires, which makes the likes of the Byzantine Empire a tough faction to start as indeed. But when are they not, am I right? especially because it was arguably the Byzantine Empire's request for aid which resulted in the First Crusade. And yes, religious wars are a big part of Field of Glory Kingdoms too. A unique window keeps track of the religious battle between the supremacy of the papacy and the authority of Islam, these two waxing and waning depending on various actions in the game. At various points then, both jihads and crusades will be called, allowing you to join either side depending on your religion. This brings us to Warfare, which is an integral part of Field of Glory Kingdoms, and comes with its own awesome surprise as well. For while armies are certainly recruited, maintained, and moved from region to region on the campaign map, and are normally fought in auto-resolve battles which can either be visually simulated or immediately calculated, if you also own Field of Glory Medieval, which is the turn-based war sim that released in 2021, you can in fact play out these battles yourself. The game has a native integration between the two games, meaning that you can simply export the game to Medieval with the click of a button, open the game as directed, and load into the battlefield. This allows you to fully control the armies yourself down to the individual unit, turning the tide of battles you otherwise might have lost if you manage to make use of excellent tactics. Considering how many different factions there are, how many different units there are, and the details the devs have gone to make them unique, creates an authentic medieval experience where you get to assume the role of both ruler and general. And frankly, that is an experience reserved for very few games. This makes the union of Field of Glory Kingdoms and Medieval honestly one of the coolest and deepest strategy experiences to date. And I love how the devs actually made a native integration between the two games, just like they did for Field of Glory Empires and Field of Glory 2 before this. In other words, what we have here is a combined grand strategy experience and a full war simulator all in one if you own both games. It took me a while to become comfortable with Field of Glory Kingdoms, even after doing the tutorial, but you know, that is the mark of a great strategy game. And once everything clicked, I actually couldn't stop playing, just having to take that one more turn. I highly recommend buying Field of Glory Kingdoms on Steam, where it's priced at a very fair $39.99. Because even without the tactical battles of FOG Medieval, this is one of those grand strategy experiences that will stay with you, where you will sink deeper and learn more by every hour, and where the game opens up to you like a flower over time. And even though it differs in various aspects, I really got that feeling I got when I first played Crusader Kings 2, and that is a rare compliment. Let me know what you think of Feel the Glory Kingdoms in the comments, and make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, thank you so much to Slytherin for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you next time. Cheers!